Blue Marble, 1972. This magnificent photograph is one of the most famous pictures of Earth ever taken, and in my opinion, the greatest. It was taken on December 7th, 1972, by the Apollo 17 crew. It is commonly referred to as the first photo of Earth taken in its entirety, or the first photo of Earth taken at all. It is true that it is the very first picture of Earth taken where you can see the entire disk, but there were pictures taken of Earth before this by NASA. There were plenty of videos and pictures taken of Earth during the Apollo missions, including the iconic Earthrise taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts on Christmas Eve, 1968. A Merry Christmas and God bless all of you, all of you on the good Earth. And pictures of Earth don't stop there. In fact, photos from outer space and low Earth orbit date back to even before NASA. So let's go back to the beginning of space travel and find and explore the earliest pictures of Earth taken from outer space. A voyage around the moon must be made in two phases. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. In the early years of space travel, taking photos from low Earth orbit, otherwise known as hyperaltitude photography, was still taking its baby steps. This does not mean that there weren't any pictures being taken, though. Many pictures were taken before the Gemini missions in 1965, but they were mostly used for military purposes. This is summarized by Paul D. Lohman Jr. of the Ghadarn Space Flight Center in his 1964 report, a review of photography of the Earth from sounding rockets and satellites. So let's go through this report together and see what it's like to take pictures of Earth in the early days of space flight. The first photos of Earth, dating back to 1946, were purely taken out of the curiosity of what Earth looked like from space. These pictures were nothing more than strapping a 35mm camera to a V-2 rocket and sending it up. As rocket technology increased, the purpose for hyperaltitude photography became more complex, with specific areas being targeted out for meteorological reasons. This kind of photography was still new in 1964, so the potential uses for the photographs were still being worked out. The technology used to take pictures of Earth in the early days of spaceflight was quite primitive to the technology that we use today. It's also important to point out that in most cases, taking pictures of Earth was not the main focus of the flight, but instead seen as an accessory experiment of the mission. In fact, none of the camera equipment mentioned in this report was specifically designed for space travel. The first pictures of Earth were taken by a 35mm motion picture camera strapped to a V-2 rocket and sent up by the United States. It was rigged to where it would take a picture every second and was launched in October of 1946. As you can see, it took this glorious picture of the southwestern United States. Over the next four years, various V-2 rockets were launched carrying aircraft cameras at various altitudes. The next rockets launched with the cameras on them were the Viking 11 and Viking 12 missions that were suborbital rockets with the K-25 aircraft camera placed on them. The K-25 aircraft camera would prove to be the most effective camera used in these missions. The next flight to carry a camera would be on the Atlas rocket. This would take a 16mm time-lapse camera to an altitude of 230 miles in 1959. The next flight was the Aero B rocket in 1960. This carried the Maurer 220 70mm aerial camera. When the Mercury missions began in December of 1960, the Redstone rockets carried an improved Maurer 220G camera on their flights. Mercury Atlas 5, 8, and 9 also carried these cameras. Mercury Atlas 6 and 7 both carried the 35mm camera on their flights. And as Lohman Jr. showed, there really were a great variety of cameras and rockets used in the early days of space travel. So let's get to the part that you've all been waiting for. The actual pictures taken in this report. Starting with the Mercury missions, we have this photo taken of the Atlantic coast and northern Spanish Sahara, taken by John Glenn on MA6. As you can see, this black and white photo shows the curve of the Earth and what looks like some land masses under the clouds. These next two are color pictures taken on the MA4 orbital flight. It is hard to see anything in this first one taken of southwest Algeria, 
but the second one is much more clear. As you see, the clouds are not blocking the breathtaking view of southern Morocco. The Atlantic coast is to the left of the picture, and the anti Atlas Mountains are in the foreground. You can even see the shadow of the clouds along with the glow of the atmosphere. Color pictures like these were very popular amongst magazines and other promotional material, but beyond that they didn't have much use. These next two were taken by Gordon Cooper in the MA-9 orbital flight, both taken with a 70mm film. Cooper was given a list of places to take pictures, and these are the results. The first one is of the mountains in the southwestern Tibet. The second one is the north shore of the Arabian Sea. These are black and white prints of color film. These photos taken by Cooper were considered a large improvement over the previous attempts of the Mercury missions, and were praised for their clarity and resolution. NASA attributed this to the locations of the areas photographed. The Tibetan Plateau is at a very high altitude, so the air between it and the capsule is very thin, so naturally it will photograph better. The pictures taken on the Mercury missions were very popular amongst magazines, but scientifically they didn't attribute much, until Cooper's flight on MA-9. 29 pictures and many more observations were taken by Cooper that would impact the future of hyperaltitude photography. The first observation that Cooper made was that the atmospheric conditions can make or break an observation. He noted that he could not see San Diego or LA due to the haze surrounding the cities but he could pick out individual roads in the southwestern United States. He also noticed that it is hard to keep an individual thing in frame for more than a minute due to the speed of the capsule traveling around the Earth. One last thing that he noted was that the haze penetrating ability of the human eye is about the same as colored film. So, all these observations became incredibly influential on future photography missions, and we can thank Cooper for that. The Viking rockets took some excellent photos as well. These were all taken by the K-25 aircraft camera at an altitude of about 150 miles. These are very detailed pictures of the American Southwest that only had to fight light air pollution. With these pictures, the K-25 aircraft camera proved itself the superior camera with the settings being best for hyper-altitude photography. Most of the Viking photos are classified for military usage, so sadly we cannot view most of the photos and these are the only ones that I can find. Well, that was interesting. To be able to go through this report and see what it was like to take pictures of Earth before we could go to the moon and take pictures of the full disk ourselves. Now this report does predict a couple of things, and what it sees is the future of hyperaltitude photography. From the geological reconnaissance prediction that became the KH-9 hexagon, to predicting interplanetary cameras that would orbit other planets like Mars. Well sure enough, we not only have reconnaissance satellites around Mars, but have had many other orbiters around other planets. Finally, Lohman Jr. lists off the main problems with hyperaltitude photography. Two of them stuck out to me the most, for two different reasons. The first one was the lack of development of space-specific camera and equipment. As mentioned in the report before, all the cameras and camera equipment were not space-specific design. In fact, most of it was aircraft-specific cameras and film. Now, aircraft film and aircraft cameras were not designed to deal with re-entry and the radiation that they would experience in space. NASA saw that the development of space-specific equipment was very much needed. The second problem with hyper-altitude photography was the legal problems that came about. You see, NASA was sending up their Viking rockets from White Sands, New Mexico, and when it would take pictures, vast areas of the Mexican land was taken in the picture. And if national borders were to get in the way of space photography, then it would make the practice almost useless. As could you imagine a picture of blue marble looking like this with all the other land censored out? As it's almost impossible to take a picture from space without capturing a vast area of the Earth's surface. So when NASA discovered that none of the countries really cared and none of them were really stopping them, they figured it was easier to ask for forgiveness than it would be for permission and kept on going. This report provides a fantastic look into what the early days of NASA and spaceflight looked like in general. 
Paul D. Lohman Jr. did a great job with this report. And to think that before we were able to send people far enough away to actually capture the full disk of the Earth, we were basically just strapping cameras to rockets and seeing what would happen. To see where we started out in 1964 and to see where we are today is simply amazing. Overall, a fascinating report. Well, thank you guys for watching and please hit that like and subscribe button if you want to. It really helps the channel out. And if you want, we'll have more of these reports coming soon. But until then, hopefully we'll get out a couple of videos and maybe even a couple of takedowns. Thank you guys for watching so very much. And I'll see you next time. Blue Earth Thing out.